Yeah, uh, I'm here, Pippin. Uh, did you want me to go ahead and get started? Uh, give me one minute because I have to do two things before we start. One is uh, we have to say that uh, we are operating under the Linux Foundation, so we uh, have to conform to antitrust policy of the Linux Foundation. The second is that there is a code of conduct uh, which uh, basically says that we have to be uh, we have to be able to disagree without being disagreeable. In short, so uh, after those two things are done, now I think uh, Marvin will present for a short while, maybe five minutes, and then we can go ahead and uh, start the regular presentation with Graham, who's also on the call. Okay, uh, thank you, Vipin. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, and uh, also uh, another extra thanks for Vipin and all of your efforts. We do really appreciate the openness and just the community that Vipin and the Hyperledger and the uh, Capital Markets Group community presents. So uh, thank you to everyone for that. Um, but this is really only gonna take uh, a couple minutes, but uh, I wanted to give everyone an update on the mortgage subgroup. Uh, since uh, the mortgage subgroup has joined the Capital Markets SIG, we've done uh, a couple of things. First off, we've completed the mortgage subgroup wiki that was released on October 1st. So we encourage everyone to go ahead and take a look at that, take a look at our charter. Um, and if you're interested, then, then please join us. Um, the intent of the mortgage subgroup is to uh, gather uh, an open community, very similar and underneath the umbrella to capital markets to try and identify some common problems and common solutions using Hyperledger uh, specifically for the mortgage subgroup. So we invite everyone that's in the mortgage industry or has an interest in it to join us and uh, to help us come up with some of those uh, solutions. Um, the, the group was started by myself and uh, Angel Alban. He's the president uh, of Zaventus, and uh, I think he may be joining us later. But um, since we released the uh, wiki on October 1st, we've also been working on, on a couple of things. We've been reaching out to the different SIGs and groups within the Hyperledger community to let them know about us, to invite them to join, and also to see if there are any uh, common use cases or, or sample use cases that we can use as a starting point for the mortgage subgroup. Uh, in addition to that, we've been working with the uh, uh, Hyperledger Fabric team to uh, come up with a couple uh, proof of concepts We've uh, been able to utilize some of the test cases that the Hyperledger community provides and have gotten a couple use cases off the, excuse me, uh, POCs off the ground. And with the, the Fabric and Hyperledger community, we've been able to get those going. So now that we have a couple POCs off the ground, we're starting to tweak them to make them uh, more applicable to the mortgage subgroup and we're also reaching out to um, our, our business partners within the mortgage community to come up with some mortgage specific use cases. Uh, for example, just over the past couple of days, Angel and I attended the Mortgage Bankers Association Conference for 2021 in San Diego, California. That's probably the biggest industry group meeting for mortgage. We told them about what the Hyperledger community is doing. We told them about the applicability of blockchain and specifically Hyperledger to the mortgage community. And there was a lot of excitement around it. So uh, I think we're really starting to pick up our momentum. And uh, again, uh, if you guys are interested, please join uh, our subgroup. We're now just getting our calendar together for the rest of the year and we'll have a mortgage specific meeting. We still don't know the cadence of that yet, but hopefully we'll get that over within the next couple of weeks. We're starting together a panel of vendors and speakers that are interested 
in speaking specifically on blockchain within the mortgage community or their interest around it. So uh, a lot of exciting things. Um, that's it. If there are any questions, uh, please reach out to me. And, and again, thank you to everyone. Thanks, uh, Marvin. Anybody wants to join the mortgage subgroup, of course, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, a couple of things. One is the next speaker, uh, Graham, has worked in mortgages. If you look at his bio carefully, you will see that he was instrumental in a mortgage-related uh, application. But right now, he is going to talk about the exciting new new um, um, application uh, of uh, digital assets on Polymesh, which is a project of Polymath. And uh, welcome, Graham, you've read his bio. Everybody knows what, uh, well, some of us know what Polymesh and Polymath can do. So please, Graham, welcome and thanks for showing up. Sure, thanks, Pippin. Um... I think I can I can probably just jump in. So I have a few slides prepared, um, probably maybe 10, maybe 20 minutes. Um, and then we can kind of go from there. And I think that then wanted to open the floor for questions afterwards, so we can do that as well. Um, and, and so I think Bippin circulated my bio, but just a brief background on me. I'm the head of tokenization at Polymath, uh, where we focus on all things security tokens. Um, a, a bit more about me. I wrote the first ever ABC book about Bitcoin. Uh, it's called B is for Bitcoin. So if anyone has any uh, two or three year olds about to learn their alphabet, um, I highly recommend going and checking that out. And then I'm also on the advisory board of Red Swan, uh, which is a company that's tokenized $2.5 billion of commercial real estate. So that's the, the largest uh, tokenization by a single entity to date uh, in the whole space. Um, and so I'm, I'll go ahead and share my screen and I think we can just jump right into the presentation that I have prepared. So everyone should be able to see my screen uh, and I'll jump into it. Um, so today we're talking about uh, Polymesh, uh, which I believe is the blockchain for capital markets. And of course I realize you know, I'm coming into a Hyperledger uh, group, uh, which talks about all things Hyperledger. And I'm saying, hey, check out this other blockchain uh, that is not Ethereum based. Um, but you know, hopefully uh, people can learn something today uh, and I'm by no means bashing uh, Ethereum or Hyperledger in the presentation, uh, I, but I think it's important to talk about, you know, why we made the design decisions that we chose uh, when we were looking to build uh, infrastructure for capital markets. And so uh, just brief background on Polymath. Uh, so our vision, everyone has equal access to economic growth. Our mission, right, so how do we do that? We automate and simplify regulated markets through blockchain. And then more specifically, uh, we're contributing to a dependable compliance focused blockchain, we're connecting market participants and we're growing the security token market. Um, and if anybody is unfamiliar, I'm sure 90 plus percent of people on the call are familiar, but just in case there's anybody who's not, what is a security token? It's a digital representation of a financial asset. So equity, debt, real estate, commodities, structured products, investment fund shares, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then I, I would kind of group security tokens into two different categories. So one would be asset tokenization, so there's an asset that exists in the world, uh, it's off chain and you represent that on chain. So some, uh, a lot of people are doing this now. So you take an Apple share, for example, you tokenize the Apple share. Now you have an Apple share that exists on a blockchain. Uh, the more interesting thing in my opinion uh, and what we focus on a bit more at Polymath is asset origination. So taking a financial asset that um, originates directly on the blockchain and exists only on the blockchain. So it's natively digital. Um, and so we hear a lot of people in the tech space talk about the progression of technology over time. Um, and so one way to think about it is uh, you have a physical letter that you mail to someone and that's how you communicate. Uh, and then you take that physical letter and instead you fax it to someone. So you're digitizing the real world thing, which is a little bit better, of course, and a little bit faster. Uh, but then you have an email, which is natively digital. Um, and so that's that's what we see with technology over time is, is there are things in the real world that then get digitized and then you have natively digital representations. And so that's what we focus a lot on polymath is making it really easy for 
the issuers of financial products and their partners, so broker dealers, banks, custodians, transfer agents, KYC providers, uh, advisors, et cetera, et cetera, for them to actually create natively digital assets and then having compliance functionality so they can trade on a secondary market in a compliant manner. And so I, I'd ask the question, um, which blockchain would you choose to, to build tokenization software connected to an ecosystem of regulated service providers? You know, I think uh, probably everyone on this meeting would say Hyperledger or maybe some uh, version of public or private Ethereum. Um, and that's what we started doing. Um, so back in 2017, Polymath was formed and we started building technology on Ethereum. It was really the only place to do so. That's where all of the developers were. That's where all the interest was. That's where all the investment was. Uh, and it was really the only place where you could build on top of the existing functionality. Um, so what we did at Polymath is we said, how can we have actual financial securities on a blockchain? And one of the first things you, you see when you look at a blockchain, especially back in 2017, is there's no concept of compliance. So you have ERC-20 tokens that are starting to take off, these utility token things, and people are starting to try to use them for securities. Um, we saw a few brave companies like, uh, uh, like Blockchain Capital, uh, and science, and they said, okay, yeah, we can use these tokens for securities. Uh, and then you realize, okay, well, actually you can't because you can't control who has access to them. Uh, anyone can trade an ERC-20 token from anyone to anyone, anywhere, any time of day, no sense of compliance, no ability to freeze transactions, no ability to freeze wallets, no abilities for an issuer to force transfer if perhaps someone loses their private key, um, or there's a court order for a divorce or a uh, God forbid a shareholder dies and the issuer needs to force transfer assets to their beneficiaries. There's no way to do that with the RC20. Um, so what we did is we said, okay, we need to build a new standard for security tokens. And so we started building ERC-1400. Um, so ERC-1400 is a backwards compatible standard with ERC-20. So if your wallet can hold the ERC-20 tokens, your wallet can hold the ERC-1400 tokens. And how we started building ERC-1400 is we got every single person in a room that we could think of, including Fabian Vogelsteller, who's the author of ERC-20. Uh, and then we also got KYC providers, transfer agents, lawyers that were formerly at the SEC, broker dealers, custodians, everyone we could think of in the capital markets ecosystem. And we said, what is, what is a standard for security tokens need to look like. And we came up with the ERC-1400. Um, so that was something that we spearheaded uh, back in 2018. Um, and it's now the most widely used standard for security tokens. So uh, consensus has their own implementation, which I believe, believe they call the, the Doriel protocol. Um, and I, I think that's what Codify is using uh, to build on. So their own implementation of ERC-1400. The government of Norway has experimented with ERC-1400. Uh, and then uh, we've talked about this recently, there's a, a top 10 worldwide bank in terms of assets under management uh, that is likely going to talk about the ERC-1400 tokens they've created uh, sort of any day now, uh, probably in a month, maybe two months. And we started building on Ethereum, you know, most widely used standard uh, in the world is what we were able to spearhead with ERC-1400. Tons of people are implementing it. Um, but there's a problem that we kept running into, and especially when we talked to very large financial institutions. And there were five main things that we kept hearing over and over again. Uh, those were governance, identity, confidentiality, compliance, and settlement. And so I'll dig into these a little bit deeper. Um, so for governance, specifically relating to forks. Um, so let's say there's an Ethereum, Ethereum Classic fork, uh, and you have a security token on the blockchain before the fork. Well, now you have two security tokens after the fork. You know, which one has the real claim to the underlying assets? Um, do you split them in half? Does the company decide we're going to go with whichever chain has the most hash power? Um, does the company decide, oh, well, we've heard this uh, influencer in the Ethereum space say that this chain is going to win out eventually. Actually, let's just freeze trading for six months and wait until there's a clear winner. You know, It's a really big problem when you start talking about issuing $100 million assets on blockchains and you say, oh, well, there's this problem where at some point you're not gonna know which one's the real asset. You know, it's just untenable for any large financial institution. So on Polymesh, uh, which is the blockchain that we've built for capital markets, Polymesh, uh, it's impossible for forks to take place. Um, and we'll, we'll probably touch on a bit of the architecture uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so identity was another huge one. Um, so how can you ensure that only the people who you want to interact with are the people you're interacting with? Um, and so again, uh, on Ethereum and other public blockchains, and, um, you, when you look at identity, there's no concept, right? So 0x123 ABC. 
Um, and what we built with ERC-1400 was the concept of whitelisting, where the issuer can say, okay, I only want 0x123ABC and 0x453A27 to be able to hold tokens. And that's because they've KYC'd them and they know that's Alice and Bob uh, kind of off chain. Well, on Polymesh, we have a concept where every single actor to get on the chain must pass a KYC process. And then on top of that, all the node operators are regulated financial entities. So that was another thing we kept hearing when we were talking to especially large banks is, well, what if I make a transaction and pay $10 of gas and that gas uh, goes to a miner in Iran or a miner in North Korea? You know, there's, there's no way that those firms are allowed to interact with those folks and just a really big question mark for them. So having node operators as regulated financial entities was a really big one for them when dealing with regulated assets. Uh, then confidentiality. So th this is one that everyone's working on right now. Um, and so we have a white paper that we've put out that's called Mercat. If anybody wants to go searching for it, M-E-R-C-A-T. Uh, and we, all, we also have a patent pending uh, on how we deal with confidentiality with Mercat. Um, so how can you have a $100 million position in your portfolio on chain that's publicly viewable generally, but then you can actually obfuscate that and have it be private. So you can move $20 million of your $100 million uh, position without alerting the market and letting people know. And so, you know, when you talk to JP Morgan, when you talk to Goldman Sachs and you say anyone can see your positions and anyone can see when you're exiting your positions, you know, they just won't use that blockchain um, for, for regulated assets. It just does not work for them. Um, compliance, obviously a huge one. That's really why Polymath was invented, is how can you have compliance on blockchains uh, specifically for regulated assets? And so as we started building on Ethereum, every single compliance functionality, because it's not baked into the base layer of the chain and the base layer of the chain has no concept of assets other than Ethereum itself, you end up deploying all of this, uh, these smart contracts for the compliance criteria. And so when you have a scenario where you want to make sure that only party A can transact with party B uh, and they can only transact a certain amount of tokens over a certain period of time, we started hitting the gas limits of Ethereum uh, sort of in year one of development. And so you can only imagine what's going to happen in year two, year three. And so what people are doing right now, and, and um, I'm sure people on the call are familiar with the concept of whitelisting, where you say, I want this address to be able to transact with my token. Um, updating your whitelist right now on Ethereum, if you don't want to wait a week, is around fifty to a hundred dollars. And you know Ethereum was marketed as this, this way to do those transactions for pennies or maybe a dollar. Um, and, and so it's not working. And of course, there are layer two solutions coming, um, and we're very excited about those. And we're keeping a close eye on, on all things layer two and how to bring down those costs and computation. But ultimately. The blockchain not having any sense of tokens at the base layer is a really big architectural challenge when you're dealing with regulated assets. And so, so that's a huge thing for us at Polymath as we build Polymesh is employing more of this specialized use case specific logic into the chain itself so that you can get the computation cost down and, and you can have a much more elegant and scalable solution specifically for regulated assets. Uh, and then finally, settlement is a huge one. Um, so on blockchains like Ethereum, Hyperledger, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there is no concept of what most financial institutions would think of as real settlement. And so what I mean by that is if I find out your Ethereum wallet, I can send you tokens at any time. Um, you can't say no. And so that doesn't really work for a lot of financial institutions when uh, what they're used to in the world of settlement is having this concept where seller must affirm settlement instructions and buyer must affirm settlement instructions. And so that, that's how all assets exist except for the native polyx token on polymath if i want to send you something you must affirm that you want to receive that asset as well and so you can of course build those things off chain um, with certain solutions and that's how exchanges work um, but on chain that's how settlement works on polymesh and so we found a lot of interest with both financial institutions and also with even other blockchains um, so the potential for trading uh, tokens on separate blockchains and then having them actually settle every hour or every day or every week back to Polymesh to be sort of the golden source of truth um, for settlement. And so th that's probably the most exciting area, at least in my opinion, where, where Polymesh really shines is our settlement engine that we've built, um, specifically talking to, to these regulated entities. Um, and so, right, so this is sort of the, the progression that we had, and I, I touched on this a bit. Um, so we went live in 2018 with our market solution. So the Polymath token studio where anybody could create managed security tokens. 
we noticed there was a lack of standardization, so we proposed ERC-1400. Uh, we, we found pretty good product market fit in 2019, and we started growing the ecosystem, so getting as many KYC providers uh, interested in security tokens and using our technology as we could, transfer agents, broker-dealers, custodians, et cetera. Um, but we noticed you know, public Ethereum was not the best solution for capital markets, at least in our eyes, and so we transitioned from this general purpose infrastructure like Ethereum to this very purpose-built use case specific infrastructure like Polymesh. Um, so we started building Polymesh in, in 2019. So what we focused on all of 2020, and we're very, very close to going live now in 2021. Um, so you could call it, you know, days away, weeks away potentially um, for our uh, Polymesh uh, mainnet to go live. And, you know, if anybody is familiar with what we're talking about, we're talking about internet speeds on this slide. Um, so, you know, you can keep using phone lines if you want um, for internet speeds. You can try to juice out um, a little bit more uh, KBs uh, per second. Um, but ultimately, what you need to do is you need to build purpose infrastructure, purpose built infrastructure, sorry. Um, so, you can keep using the existing infrastructure that exists, or you can try to build something that's specific to your use case that functions a lot better. And so, you know, now we have, you know, 300 uh, megabytes per second. We have gigabit speeds per second for internet speeds. Whereas if we kept building on phone lines, you know, maybe we could get to 28 uh, KBs and then 33 KBs, you know, maybe we could, or we can start building uh, phone, phone uh, fiber optic cable instead of phone lines and start using those. And so that's what we've seen in the blockchain space as well. Uh, we start to see NFT companies building their own blockchain. Uh, Dapper Labs has built Flow. Uh, because all they need to do is NFTs. They don't need to do supply chain logistics. Um, they don't need to uh, engage in, uh, they don't need to build farming uh, infrastructure for uh, tokens. They don't need to build decentralized exchanges uh, like Uniswap. Um, you know, all Dapper Labs needs to do is make the best blockchain for NFTs. So they built their own blockchain called Flow. Um, you know, remains to be seen if that is the best uh, way to go about things, but that's what we think in terms of regulated assets is there needs to be a purpose-built infrastructure specifically for these regulated assets for capital markets. And, you know, decisions that we made early on, you know, do we want to fork Ethereum? Um, do we want to make this a completely public blockchain? Do we want to make it private? Is it permissioned? Uh, what kind of finality do we have? Uh, you know, you need to think of, can you get dev talent? Um, what kind of licenses do you want to do? Is it completely open source? Um, how is the ecosystem? So all, all these decisions uh, that we've been making over the last few years, uh, especially with the architecture, um, let, landed us on, on Polymesh. And now we're very, very close uh, to our mainnet launch. You know, as I mentioned, days, maybe weeks away. Um, if there's anybody listening to this from the Polymath community, I know they're watching my words very, very closely for, for uh, how long away mainnet is because they've been waiting for a while. Um, but so why mainnet, right? Like, why do we build a blockchain? Um, and we've talked about that a lot, um, but uh, in terms of our success, you know, we, we spearheaded ERC-1400, as I mentioned, the most widely standard in the world. Uh, there have been 225 tokens created, now more than that actually, um, since I created this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we made the first ever self-serve product on Ethereum to create managed security tokens. Um, but ultimately uh, it was all about um, creating a blockchain specifically for regulated assets. And so in terms of our mainnet launch, um, and a little bit more information about how Polymesh uh, is structured. Uh, Polymesh is launched by the Polymesh Association, which is a not-for-profit member-based association where Polymath is just one member of many. And so the Polymesh Association provides resources to support the advancement and adoption of a diverse Polymesh community. Uh, and the Polymesh Association will control 250 million PolyX. Um, and so the PolyX is the native token uh, of the Polymesh blockchain. And so we're actually really excited. Uh, the uh, Polymesh Association was formed this week. Um, so I believe it was made public at some point uh, late last night. Um, and we actually uh, tweeted that out. Um, so the Polymesh Association is live. So mainnet is, is coming any day now. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the interesting things about Polymesh is all the node operators are regulated financial entities. Um, so a few of you may know some of these firms. Um, so some of those to start are Intoro, Oasis Pro Markets, Digivault, the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, Bloxin, and Etonic Custody. So there's 14 that we have to start. We're looking to grow that number to 20, 25, 50, 100 as time goes on. Um, obviously more node operators is better. And so we've been talking to a number of financial institutions over the last few years. Um, and, and we have uh, potentially a few very exciting ones uh, coming soon that we're really uh, looking
looking forward to announcing, but I can't say anything on uh, this presentation, sadly. Um, and so uh, what we had to do before mainnet launch as well is we wanted to launch and set and incentivize testnet. You know, you need actual people testing a blockchain before you go live with it. Worst thing you could do would be to launch on mainnet and then realize that you have some catastrophic bugs uh, or that it can't handle the load of a thousand people um, or, or that, you know, the buttons aren't working uh, on some UIs. And, and we found a ton of those things. Uh, that we were very happy to fix. And so we had 4,300 unique users onboarded to the chain. Um, and so that's a big shout out to F O'Brien, one of our uh, amazing uh, bug squashers and community members. And so there were 7,400 uh, keys staking PolyX on the testnet, which we thought was a really big success. So people were very excited about staking. Um, people love proof of stake blockchains. They love the ability to contribute to the security of the network without having to you know, create a uh, football field sized um, mining operation. Um, and then also we had the successful completion of two independent code audits. So those have both come back, uh, both with green lights. And so may net coming very, very soon. Um, a bit about PolyX. Um, so I mentioned PolyX is the native protocol token of the PolyMesh blockchain. Uh, if you have Poly, you can upgrade that uh, from Ethereum today. So Poly is an ERC20 token uh, on Ethereum. And you can actually bridge that one-to-one -one, uh, between Ethereum and PolyMesh for Poly to PolyX. And so there is a bridge uh, between Ethereum. Uh, another interesting thing, if anybody's interested, uh, PolyMesh is built using Substrate. Um, so Substrate is the framework that Polkadot uses, uh, Kusama, Edge, a number of these other blockchains. So interoperability is a potential uh, exciting thing in the future. Where, as I mentioned, some blockchains we're talking to are excited about having tokens trading on that blockchain, but then actually settlement occurring on a hourly, daily, weekly basis on PolyMesh. So connections between Hyperledger, connections between Ethereum, connections between Polkadot and these other uh, substrate-based chains is something that could be very exciting in the future. Um, the, the other really interesting thing about PolyX is it's a FINMA regulated utility token. Um, so FINMA is, you can think of them as the SEC uh, in Switzerland. So FINMA have buckets assets into three categories. One is asset, AKA security, uh, the other one is uh, payment token, aka currency, and the third one is utility token. Um, so PolyX has actually received the utility token designation from them, which is uh, obviously very, very exciting, uh, especially in terms of regulatory compliance um, and making sure we check all the boxes and that we're doing things that a regulator is on board with. Um, so mainnet's coming soon. I mentioned a few times, you know, days, weeks away, very, very soon. Um, and if anyone is a developer on the call, um, I encourage you to check out our SDK. Um, so a, a lot of what we do at, at PolyMath and PolyMesh is making sure that financial intermediaries can easily plug into this new world of blockchains uh, for regulated assets. So if you want to create an asset, if you want to act as a transfer agent for an asset, if you want to provide KYC services for securities, if you want to be a custodian, um, you shouldn't have to build your own blockchain. Um, we've done that. We've done that. We've done all the research. We've done all the heavy lifting. We've hired all of the uh, the, the tens of devs um, to make sure that we can build a blockchain that we think it works for capital markets. And so all you have to do is plug into our SDK. So you don't necessarily have to know how the blockchain works. You just need to know how your application works and you can plug directly into our SDK and you don't necessarily have to get so deep into the weeds of how blockchains function in order to provide services on blockchain. So that, that's one thing that we're, we're very, very excited about. Uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, if you have questions uh, you don't feel like asking right after this, um, there's my email, also my Twitter uh, that I'm on all day and just how to follow along uh, with, with all things Polymath. Um, there's our Reddit, Twitter, our Medium, and our Telegram group as well. Um, so I think we'll we'll open the floor for questions. I think, Vivian, uh, if, if we have time, uh, I believe we do. Um, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Yeah, uh, please raise your hand or ask a question directly. Thank you. Hi, uh, Graham. This is uh, Kurti here. Uh, th thank you for the presentation. Great overview. Um, could you uh, tell us a little more about the kind of smart contracts that Polymesh supports today? Uh, so today, nothing. Um, so Substrate actually doesn't have smart contract functionality yet. Um, mm -hmm. And so I actually think that's one of the interesting things is you can create tokens today on Polymesh. Um, you can in, engage in, you can implement compliance criteria. You can create attestations for certain addresses and say, Alice is from the United States and she's under a buy lockup with regard to this specific token for one year. 
Um, so, th so there is no smart contract yet. And, and still you can do all of this functionality with regulated assets that works for financial institutions. So of course there, there will be functionality um, for smart contracts at some point, um, but Substrate Substrate's not there yet. Um, you know, it, it's pretty much waiting on the Web3 Foundation and, and Gavin Wood um, and that team uh, until they can build that out. And, and partly why we've done that as well is because we get to piggyback off their infrastructure. Um, so we've worked pretty closely with the Web3 Foundation throughout uh, our entire architecture of Polymesh. Um, and we really like their team. We really like what they've done. Um, but yeah, ultimately waiting on Web3 uh, to, to implement smart contract functionality in Substrate, which I think they projected um, for 2022, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Someone could possibly correct me. Brilliant, thanks. So there are a couple of questions. One is, of course, uh, whether you would share your uh, slides yeah, sure. uh, with us, uh, because a lot of people are asking about your contact and obviously, you know, sure. uh, they can they can get that from the from our wiki page. Um, the any other questions, guys? Uh, there was one more question. You know, obviously, all about how how far away is uh, the release? You know, that's always the question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh... You know, days or maybe weeks away. Um, I see. I see Brendan's question there. Is that the first block or public asset access? Let's let's call that the, the first block. Um, and so, likely, what's going to happen is we will launch the first block, and then there will be some internal testing, uh, and then we would go live with the UIs. Um, so you, you wouldn't want to put all push all the UIs live the same day that Genesis block launches. You know, what what if there is a bug that you didn't really realize on testnet, um, and you have to reset the chain? Um, so of course, you know, we don't foresee that happening, but it's best practice to, to go live with Genesis block, have some internal testing for a couple of days, um, and then have UIs go live. And so really what we were waiting on primarily was the formation of the Polymesh Association. So that's now done. Um, there's some final, you know, T's to be crossed, I's to be dotted, documents to be signed, um, and then going live as soon as possible. No one wants uh, Polymesh to go live uh, as badly as me and, and the rest of the team. So um, we're making sure that we do that as quickly as possible. Any more, guys? Uh, someone has raised their hand. Let me see who that is. Yeah, I see. I see in the chat. What do you see happening on Polymath for investment funds, Chris? Could you could you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, he's got his hand up. Thanks, Graham. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm a multi-asset uh, alternative investment manager, and we've been looking at alternative ways to distribute, uh, you know, shares and get. Uh, assets into more hands. So polymath is one of those things we've been keeping an eye on. So in that regard, um, we're an investment fund essentially looking for a broader base. And uh, is polymath one of those functions is, or is it an infrastructure that we could use to distribute um, a compliant um, fund uh, beyond that of a traditional uh, alternative asset manager, hedge fund, VC, that sort of thing, if that adds any color. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that that makes a lot more sense. Thank you. Um, yeah, so so that is largely what we see Polymesh as. Um, so anyone can onboard to Polymesh, you know, provided you're not on an OFAC blacklist, even though I mentioned identity is a key component. Um, and so what you could do is you could have some potential um, investors, but then there could also be some potential investors that you don't know that live on Polymesh. And I will be very, very careful by by saying, you know, we are not a broker dealer, um, so we do not find investors for you. Um, that, that is on you or your broker dealer partners or your broker dealer network that you're working with or your advisors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but that is the idea, right? It is maybe you have uh, a network that you're aware of, um, but then perhaps there are some more that exist uh, on this Polymesh blockchain thing. Um, and they might be interested more in token-based investments than they would be with, with a piece of paper. Um, so yeah, we, we, we do not uh, help you uh, find investors, but potentially that could be one thing that could be one way that you use to, uh, to get wider distribution. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, we're not looking for you guys to help in terms of um, new investors or anything. We'd be act, you know, actively you know, pushing people on, on chain, I guess. Um, 
to utilize the the network and the infrastructure to you know add alternative assets into their their wallets uh, into their portfolios um, uh, because right now it's essentially a paper-based system and uh, we're looking to modernize that with something like polymath and the polymesh system cool yeah I mean I would I would love if you could send me an email and we, and we could talk further about this and perhaps get some more folks from the from uh, our team on the call um, uh, yeah I think that sounds very exciting and this is uh, largely who, who we speak to mostly um, is folks like yourselves. Great. I'll certainly be able to, I'll certainly reach out, Graham, for sure. Cool. Thanks. Appreciate it. Guru, looks like you're unmuted. All right. Thank you. Uh, Graham, uh, Guruvinder Aluwale here. Thanks so much. Um, Polymath has done great work um, and glad to see the work by Polymesh as well. Uh, Two part question related. One is, uh, if you look at the broad space of um, uh, assets and securities, where are you seeing kind of most maturity, like some of the examples you were talking about, bonds, equities, real estate, and so on, where are you seeing the most, most uh, uh, kind of adoption and maturity? And relatedly, are you familiar with the work that Societe Generale has done on the issuance of bonds and any, any comments you have on the infrastructure that they are using? Uh, yeah, so in terms of uh, maturity, I think real estate and debt, uh, at least for us, that, that's been the largest one. Um, so real estate, I, I mentioned Red Swan tokenizing $2.5 billion. Um, there's been a few other REITs. Um, there's Realty, which is tokenizing uh, houses kind of all across America now, I think. Um, and so we, we've seen real estate as a really big kind of early leader. Um, what we're seeing now, especially as we talk to more, more banks and more large financial institutions is, is structured products um, in debt specifically. Um, so especially when you have something like a syndicated loan, for example, uh, and yeah, Red Swan. Um, so I, uh, the website's redswan.io. Um, and, and so what we've seen recently is a lot of syndicated loan interest. Um, so you have five parties. There's a lot of paper shuffling back and forth. Um, there's companies that are now um, ensuring that all of that is digitized and documented. Um, and now then you just take the paper syndicated loan that you'd have and you, you have a fully digitized version um, where now you can perhaps have it be a little bit more liquid between the five parties that, that have um, created it and that are holding it. Um, so any, anywhere we have large origination costs um, and, and long times to get to market and to close deals, that's where we're seeing um, the biggest interest. And so, and initially we thought, you know, it would be startups raising a million dollars and they want to tokenize their equity, but they already have pretty uh, well-worn paths to do that, that aren't that cumbersome. Um, and ultimately VCs, you know, they just want to um, hold all the equity themselves. And then they're going to maybe want to do one round um, pre IPO. And then they're going to want to go on the NASDAQ, you know, so security tokens are, are helping a lot more in the private issuance market um, where there's private, um, Private actors, less liquidity, more confusion in terms of who owns what, um, large conversion um, criteria where, you know, if X happens, now you own 20% instead of 15%. Those types of things, being able to automate all, all that criteria on chain is really exciting for them. So bringing origination costs down and bringing time down is really big for, for these banks that we're talking to. And then in terms of, of SockGen, um, so, uh, yeah, so I mean, it's amazing to see SockGen um, uh, uh, doing that MakerDAO proposal was really, really cool to see. Um, they're definitely at the forefront um, in terms of all things security tokens. Um, and so I believe they're using uh, Ethereum for something today. Um, and then uh, th that is what I can comment uh, in terms of SockGen. Um, there's there's potential for SockGen to... to uh, do a ton of different things in the future. Um, and, you know, we definitely see them as the leaders. Um, we've seen a few other banks um, coming out, but uh, SockGen, uh, BMP, uh, lots of banks in Europe um, that are really at the forefront of this. Um, and we think it's because uh, the FCA um, and then Baffin as well. Um, and the French regulator, uh, the AMF, I believe, um, you know, we see them as very forward thinking. And so one of the huge differences between Europe and uh, America that we've noticed, uh, at least in, in recent times, is in Europe, you can have a natively digital instrument be recognized and you can use the blockchain as the quote golden source of truth. Whereas in, in the States, uh, you can't really do that yet, at least not with a, pri with a public instrument. Um, you're still required to have the, the real share 
um, exist offline on a piece of paper, whereas in Europe, they're much more forward thinking. So um, yeah, we, yeah, we see really big things coming from, from SockGen and, and a few of these other European banks. So you saw the question on, are there any financial entities lined up to be onboarded after Polymesh? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, and uh, the ability to stake available. Uh, yeah, so in terms of financial entities, um, so we mentioned uh, the 14 that are node operators. Um, then we also have a number of other firms, I believe over 50 um, that we've been working with for uh, quite some time now with, with the ERC 1400. And so what I would say about that is the, the entities, um, they don't really care about the technology generally. Um, what they care about it is making money in their business model. And so when you say, hey, can you onboard to this new technology? You know, that sounds like a cost for them um, and not really very exciting. So really entities are onboarding onto new technology where there's a business case to be made. And so we, we've noticed that with custodians, you know, the custodians will integrate as soon as there's a business who wants them to custody their tokens. They won't integrate before that because there's not really any use case for them, unless they're a bank with a massive innovation department who wants to conduct some research. Um, so yes, there are financial entities lined up. Um, there's the 14 node operators that are running nodes. And then there's the 15 ecosystem providers that 50, five, zero. Uh, ecosystem providers we've been working with over the years um, who are going to be providing services for tokens that are soon to launch. Um, and, and that's really where, where we see, you know, institutions come when there's a business case to be made, when there's an asset, when they can provide services, when they can earn their fees that they're generally typical, uh, that, that they typically make. And so then also uh, the ability to stake available right after mainnet launch. Yeah, so staking for, uh, for a general user will we'll commence as soon as UIs turn on. Um, so I mentioned mainnet launch, internal testing for a couple of days, public public launch for all the user interfaces shortly after that. It's called you know maybe seven, 14 days, something like that is what we've heard from our tech team. Um, and, and that's where staking would, would be made available. Any other questions? Uh, otherwise I'll, I'll start asking questions. I think uh, two questions. Uh, one is, as you have mentioned before, it was the divergence of value for gas, for Ethereum, uh, which obviously caused everyone to rethink using Ethereum for everything. Uh, you know, used to, used to be pennies, now it's tens of dollars and God knows what it's gonna be later. Uh, so are you concerned about that same effect with the PolyX? Yeah, yeah. so first I'll say gas is one thing um, that we noticed as, as being a, a reason to, to build different infrastructure, but ultimately it was, it was building everything as second layer smart contracts. I think that was the biggest one. And then identity uh, was also the biggest one. So it was the compliance, it was the identity and it was, uh, it, it was the settlement as well. So ensuring that both buyer and receiver must always affirm settlement instructions. Um, sorry, buyer, buyer and, and seller uh, affirming settlement instructions. And so I think those were the big three ones. Um, fee, fees were sort of secondary. Um, when you're talking to a small issuer who's you know, issuing a $100,000 note, then the fees are very important, of course. But when you're talking to a massive financial institution and you tell them, you know, you got to pay 20 bucks each time you do this, it's not a huge disincentive for them. Um, but then in terms of, of architecture um, for Polymesh um, being built on Substrate, there's no concept of paying more in fees to get ahead of the line. Um, so it's just a, a fundamental difference between Substrate and, and, and Ethereum-based chains where, uh, you know, I have a certain amount of computation that I need to execute, I pay a specified amount, we can call it gas in PolyX, and there's no concept of me being able to pay more to get ahead of other transactions. So the transactions are ordered simply in, in, the, uh, in the way that they come in. So, so that, that is a fundamental difference. So you know, maybe that architecture doesn't work. Um, uh, you know, I like the Web3 Foundation. I think Gavin Wood uh, has built some pretty good architecture there, uh, with Ethereum and then also with Polkadot. Um, and with all things substrate. So, so that's uh, what I, how I would answer that. Yeah, I mean, I was focused purely on the uh, value of PolyX. 
I mean, I, I, I know that there are other reasons for uh, getting onto a uh, purpose-built chain like Polymesh. Uh, so unless you have some kind of control, I mean, even for transactions, forget about issuance, uh, you know, what if I want to sell my uh, holding to another person who's also been KYC'd or identified properly, do I pay a transaction fee or is it happen without, I mean, is that borne by the financial institution? Got it. Um, so, so if you're transacting on chain, you do need to pay a, a poly X fee. Um, so, you know, same concept as Ethereum. When I, when I pay, I need to pay a little bit of ETH to make a transaction. When I make a transaction on Polymath, I pay a little bit of PolyX to make that transaction. Um, what we're seeing, though, is we're seeing institutions want to make use of, of this, uh, this piece of infrastructure we built that, we, that we call a relayer, where I can still hold keys that prove that I am, you know, 0x123. Um, but someone else can pay the transaction fee for that transaction. And so we're seeing this as a really big potential uh, use case for Polymesh, but then also something that we could potentially use on other blockchains as well is this relayer service where I want to prove in a cryptographic way that I have the private key associated with 0x123 ABC, but I don't want to go buy this PolyX thing, or I don't want to go buy this ETH thing. And so the financial institution that I, that I bank at or that I custody at or that I designated to be my gas payer, I just pay them five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, or on the institutional side, I pay them $10,000 a month and they pay all my gas fees for me. I still click sign so I can sign the transaction proving that I want to do this and proving that in a cryptographic way, but someone else can pay those gas fees on my behalf. So that's what we're seeing a lot now is in the traditional world, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily have to, uh, buy a, a different asset other than the one I want to transact with in order to make a, a transaction. You know, when I'm in my bank account and I want to send a US dollars somewhere, I, I don't need to go buy Canadian dollars to pay the transaction fees, for example. Uh, that's me being a Canadian uh, showing. But uh, that's what we're seeing banks want to do on blockchains now is when I want to trade Apple stock, I shouldn't have to own uh, Google stock. Uh, and pay the transaction fees in Google stock. And that's what a lot of people think of it as, you know, of course, us being in the native blockchain world, we understand, you no, know, you need the, you need the native token to pay the gas fees, but that's not how most users want to interact with blockchains. And so we see this relayer service as, as being a really big um, onboarding mechanism that, that helps more and more regular everyday users become comfortable with blockchains is some institution somewhere paying the on-chain gas fees for them while they just pay their regular uh, subscription fees per month via credit card or via wire transfer or whatever. I mean, coming back to the original question, it still holds that if the financial institution is going to have to pay more per transaction, then they will pass on the cost to me. And you know, this whole business with uh, Robinhood and order flow and everything else is related to this uh, issue, which is the uh, sort of siren song of uh, having a free account in Robinhood is actually being paid for with order flow. And they are going to tighten down on that. Uh, now, if PolyX started, starts diverging in cost, you know, because of demand or whatever, uh, and the only way to issue PolyX is by staking and by uh, being part of the consensus mechanism, then it's possible that uh, the gas prices may go up. So in a crypto economic sense, uh, you know, unless if it is just scarcity built in like, like uh, let's say Bitcoin, um, it, it may not help uh, you know, make this more amenable to retail transactions. That's that's all I'm saying. No, no, I agree. And I think that's why, you know, we're seeing all of these layer twos starting to pop up is people are, smart people are dealing with this, this problem in different ways. And I think eventually we'll find a solution. You know, smart developers always find a solution. You know, event, uh, originally all you could do is send text on the internet. 
Um, then you could only send a photo and then you could only send a video and then you could only send a high def video and then you could only do VR, you know? So eventually the scaling solutions come about. I don't, we don't know exactly what they'll look like today. Um, but you know, I have faith that uh, at some point we'll be able to do all these things on blockchains, um, for, for appropriate costs that everybody's uh, happy with. Well, having worked with, uh, um, developers and being a developer myself for more than 30 years, I don't have the same optimism you have. But <laughs> maybe that's because, uh, you know, that shows that uh, I'm an old fart. But, <laughs> but it also could mean that, you know, certain things are built into our human psyche, like certain ways of doing things. Anyway, uh, there are a couple of more questions on the um, one is from Guru, which asks about whether it is built on substrate, which I think you said yes. Yep, yeah, that's uh, a yes. Uh, second is, uh, you guys already registered with SEC, but he, I don't think so. I think it was more FINMA, which was, uh, it's a Swiss SEC. Uh, that's me providing the answers to it right now because <laughs> I, I... You're doing a great job so far. <laughs> Uh, SEC has, you know, have they, okay, so here is uh, money asking about interoperability, which is, of yep. course, one of my concerns as well, and you said something about bridges uh, with uh, PolyX, but, you know, we have to have more than PolyX bridges, we have to have a way to, for the assets themselves to uh, be interoperated. Um, yeah, so 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 many. I can provide uh, a bit more color on that. Um, so you know, interoperability is not a day one focus uh, for Polymesh. Um, we're very excited about interoperability, and, and we obviously know that, that that's the future. And building on Substrate opens the door um, for easier interoperability with with any Substrate based chain. Um, so whether whether we decide you know in the future Polymesh becomes a a, a pair thread or a pair chain. Um, and how interoperability works. You know, we haven't thought incredibly deeply about that today. Um, to be honest, you know, we're building a blockchain for capital markets where people can issue uh, financial securities and trade those financial securities and uh, do that in a compliant manner. That, that's our day one focus. Um, but of course, you know, we're keeping a really, really close eye on, okay, when's the right time um, to focus more on interoperability? You know, that may come in 2022. That would probably be my best guess. Um, but yeah, keeping a close eye on it, not a day one focus, but uh, excited about the opportunities that, that will happen in the future. Well, I run the interoperability working group in uh, DCGI, which is a digital currency global initiative in ITU. And we uh, um, sort of have been looking at all this. Of course, we have been looking at uh, substrate and parachains and you know their standard for interoperability. But we believe that interoperability is a, um, let's say, primary capability. And the, the faster you look at it, the better it's going to be. Interoperability by design is one of the uh, you know, just like security by design or privacy by design, um, which you already have seem to have handled. So I urge you to bump it up in your priority list. I will, <laughs> I will let the dev team know, <laughs> definitely. Uh, okay, so what, what, what next? Uh, is there, are there any other questions for Graham? Otherwise I'll continue my My, uh, doesn't look like there's more. Uh, we have uh, five more minutes left. So I'll uh, ask one or two more questions. Oh, there is uh, Chris O'Connor raising his hand. So I guess I should yield to him. Thank you. It's me again, Graham. Um, public securities have been brought up a few times. Um, but what is the depth of this? Is are you looking to replace traditional capital markets with some sort of poly mesh, poly math infrastructure, or is it simply like a para 
market uh, for public securities that already exists, you know, stock market sort of stuff. Yeah, I, th I think either, either is appropriate, right? Um, so I, I had that slide initially where you can take an Apple stock, you can tokenize it, and that Apple stock already exists, and now it exists in two places. Um, so someone can trade it that potentially they, they didn't have access to before, but then you can also generate natively digital uh, security tokens. And so I, I think both make sense. Um, my personal opinion is security tokens start eating the private market first. Um, so more and more private assets get issued on blockchains rather than not on blockchains. Um, so we have, we'll call it 5 billion of those today. Um, th that is nothing in the grand scheme of things. That's a drop in the bucket in terms of the securities world. Um, but, but that's where things start being eaten. Um, because as I mentioned, you know, typical tech startup, you know, VC is going to want to do things. They've always done it. They're going to have the capital managed on Carta. Um, and then they're going to go public on the NASDAQ. Um, that is, is so tried and true. And people make so much money that way that, that it's hard to see uh, a different way of doing things. And the different way has to be 100x better. And personally, I don't think security tokens are 100x better for those public securities um, right now, just because the infrastructure is not there. Um, but where security tokens are 100x better is in the private market. Um, so syndicated loans, real estate, um, a debt offering, um, private equity, you know, those things are 100x better in security tokens because you can get the cost down so much and you can get the time down so much for when people are negotiating any deals and when you can automate um, any types of conversion process or redemption process or, or stock options, for example, you can redeem those really easily and automate every, every single functionality on security tokens. That, that's where security tokens are going to eat first. Private markets, and then eventually, mm. you know, Nasdaq will be built on a blockchain at some point in time. You know, I don't know if that's five years from now, ten years from now, um, but I believe totally that will happen that. at some point in time. <laughs> okay, thanks for adding some further color. Cool. Anything else? Okay, here goes uh, another question, which is um, a staking. Staking is felt to be the solution, uh, you know, in terms of proof of work, uh, but staking has its own problems, which is uh, the uh, devolution of voting power to large holders, uh, which, you know, has been proven in a uh, democratic or decentralized system to be uh, extremely harmful. What are the steps you guys are taking? Are you uh, doing something similar to what, uh, for example, Vitalik has said, uh, quadratic voting, any kind of uh, tamping down of the power of centralized actors who hold large quantities of tokens? Yeah, so um, the... Uh... The, the blockchain decentralization maximus, maximalists are not going to like my answer here, but um, we've almost done the opposite. <laughs> um, so because we're, we're building a blockchain for capital markets, um, the financial institutions don't really care if the Polymesh Association has a lot of power um, or if a, a few of us uh, in the association have a lot of power. Um, they don't mind that at all. Um, what we've done today is, is it, there's no concept of quadratic voting, but we've definitely looked into that and that might be, be something that we implement. Um, you know, the Web3 Foundation might implement that on Polkadot. Um, we have no idea at this point, and perhaps we, we just integrate that easily with sort of a few lines of code once that becomes available. Um, nothing to cite on that front, but how functions work today, if let's say someone wants to make a parameter change or a code change um, to the base layer of Polymesh is... Uh, a user, a holder of PolyX uh, creates a bond with tokens. So let's call it 10,000 PolyX. Um, they say, I want this change to be implemented. Other users can vote yes or no uh, by, by showcasing their support by their PolyX amounts. Um, and then ultimately that decision then goes to the, the uh, governing council of PolyMesh. Um, and so the governing council right now is a few small, small uh, actors that are in the PolyMesh association. And so, you know, that is by no means the decentralization of power. Um, that is almost uh, kind of the increase in power. And it's because this is a blockchain with a very specific use case. We want to build something for the largest financial institutions in the world to be comfortable with blockchain. And saying, uh, yeah, the, these nameless, face, faceless uh, 
individuals that are perhaps in jurisdictions that you're not able to interact with are deciding the future of this blockchain. You know, they don't like that. Um, that's something that most of them don't like. And um, that's why we've taken the approach where today I have Polyx, I bond it, I want a change to be made. Other users of the chain can say yes or no. And then if it says, if, if everyone says yes, then it goes, um, not if everyone says yes, but if there's a majority, you know, and it seems like this is something that makes a lot of sense, it goes to the, to the Polymesh Governing Council. Governing Council says, you know, do we actually want to do this? Yes or no? Um, and so ultimately, you know, that is not the decentralization of power, but we haven't noticed that as a huge concern um, from the institutions that we've been talking to. Of course, it's a concern in the general blockchain world, and we're going to decentralize that as much as possible as time goes on. Um, but for day one, um, you know, the Polymesh Governing Council sort of does uh, uh, have the authoritative power to to direct the chain in the manner that they want, um, because, you know, it's going to be a new chain. It needs to potentially make uh, life altering decisions and surgical decisions as quickly as possible. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense for specialists to make some of the decisions. Um, but ultimately, you know, we, uh, anyway, uh, we are out of time, but we can go ahead for a couple of more minutes if you have the time. Otherwise, we can call it a day. Uh, but, you know, we can continue this conversation outside. Uh, you know, the in the US, for example, I mean, forget about decentralization. Uh, governance models uh, often work well when there's a broad consensus. Um, and in the US, there used to be, uh, you know, voting based on property held and so on and so forth, but it was maybe 150 years ago, but um, that fell by the wayside. To be a registered voter, you had to have certain amount of property. I mean, same thing holds even in um, capital markets to, uh, to be in an ICO, to purchase or to trade certain things, you need to have a net worth of, you know, whatever, 500,000, million, depending, you know, there are various tiers. And that is cost regulatory capture and problems with that. So that's, that's the only um, caveat. We have to have some way of governing. <laughs> I mean, so obviously you guys have chosen one way and it'll have problems and we'll have to look at the real world use cases to see what kind of destruction or pro problems it's going to cause before we decide to change that. But definitely have that in your mind. Yeah, it's a huge concern that we have at, at the Polymesh Association is, you know, how should this thing run? How should people be able to direct the future of the chain? How should upgrades get made? Um, how can we ensure that a bank is comfortable using this? How can we ensure that the security token users are comfortable using this? How can we ensure that stakers um, feel confident in placing their, their, their you know, hard-earned capital here to provide security to the network to try to earn rewards in PolyX? Um, so yeah, it's something we think about all the time. Um, what we've come up with uh, today is what we've come up with for V1. That doesn't mean that that's how it will be in V2 or V3 or V4 or V5. And so a constant evolution is I think what we've seen with every blockchain as time goes on, um, perhaps except for Bitcoin, um, <laughs> where, where things stay, stay the same. Um, yeah, yeah, something we think about a lot. And, and then, yeah, Bip and I, I do actually have to, have to head out. Um, but uh, yeah, in closing comments, um, if anybody wants to reach out to me, please do. That's uh, Graham at polymath.network is, is my email. Um, and then uh, more Grams uh, on Twitter. Um, and if anybody uh, wants to ping me, you know, ask more questions. Uh, if anybody wants to chat about anything, happy to do that anytime. And Vipin, thanks so much for, for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Graham, for showing up and uh, doing this very interesting presentation on the future of capital markets. And uh, that's it for now. And I'm going to close the call. Thanks to everyone for attending and asking interesting questions. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody. Thanks.